Hey everybody, it's Bobby. I hope you had a great weekend. You know, so much has been made lately because we've been on the mats here, uh, letting this, this uh, teeing ground grow back in a little bit with this brand new state-of-the-art mat back here. And the question is, is that really real? Is it, is it good practice? Should I go somewhere else? And I'm gonna tell you, this is not something that I just thought of this week. This is something I have a lot of experience with and I'd like to share it with you. So, uh, back in the mid to late 90s, I got my first job in golf at a driving range. And I was the only employee other than the owner. His name was Joe. Now at the time I was in my late 20s and he was about 56 as I recall. He wasn't a pro, but he was a pretty good player. He's about a three handicap. And we spent a lot of time together because we were the only two guys at the range. And, and Joe, uh, maybe I didn't learn that much about the golf swing from him, but I learned a lot about the English language because he was, he was something else. A euphemism in every single sentence. He could rattle off more than, than anybody I've ever known. And if I ever say something that is new to you, you can trust, I got it from Joe because I learned a new one from him every day. I remember him calling one time and saying, he was calling to ask me when I would be at work because he couldn't leave until I got there, which is a reasonable question. But I answered, hello. He says, Bob, my wife and I have been like two ships in the night and we're hoping to get reacquainted this evening. And I was wondering before I turn into a pumpkin, at what hour do you plan to darken the door? And I go, your wife? What? He goes, Bobby, what time do you intend to be here? Oh, oh, about 30 minutes. <laughs> but that was like all the time with him. It's just euphemism, euphemism, euphemism. So it was, it was a pleasure to hear him speak, believe it or not. And anyway, when we uh, practiced there, because he and I both hit five, 600 balls every single day, because we were the only two there, and, and if we weren't serving and dispensing balls to a customer, we were hitting balls. But he always went to the mats, and I always went to the grass. And I think I remember early on declaring in this pear-shaped tone of mine. Well, you know, I, uh, I don't hit on the mats. I hit on the grass. It's more realistic. And uh, I think I thought that was pretty cool of me to make that statement. And, but didn't deter Joe. He always stayed on the, on the mats, and he was a good player. And one day I pressed him on a little bit. I said, hey, you know, what's, you're deluding yourself over here. You're, you're thinking that this is realistic. You're hitting all these good shots here. You know, you're making yourself think that better than actual progress is being made. You know, you don't have to make as quality of a golf swing to hit a good shot off the mat. So why would you even do that? And he said, well, Bobby, to each his own. And I could tell he was a little annoyed by me because he hasn't asked, you know, he never asked me why I arrived at my preference and here I am pressing him on his. I said, but you're fooling yourself. And Joe said, Bobby, just keep in mind that the shoe can rub both ways. I said, what's that mean? He says, well, you think it's a bad thing that uh, you don't have to make as good of a swing on the mats to hit a good shot. Well, I think it's a good thing. I said, how so? He says, Bobby. And then he went on to tell me that so much about golf is your self-image, that we play as well as we believe we can play. And so a person who spends a lot of time on the mats hits a lot more quality shots. As a result of that, develops an elevated uh, self-image and therefore takes that self-image to the golf course. And, and as a result of that, plays better on the long haul. And I've got to give him some attaboy points for that right off the cuff. I thought that was pretty good. I was maybe a six on a scale of one to 10 for an answer, but I still wasn't completely sold. And the reason I say that is because it just, I'd condition myself so much to believe the grass, the grass, the grass, the grass. But then I started experiencing problems with my two and my three iron. This is back in the day when we still hit those. And those were really handy clubs to have in for second shots in on par fives. But they went south and I could hit them off a tee, but I couldn't hit them off the ground. And he said, Bobby, why don't you humor an old man who doesn't know what he's talking about and bring that two and three iron over here and hit, a, hit 108 balls. That's how many was in a, in a basket. 108 balls with him. And then tell me what you discover. Well, what I discovered was about 20 shots into that 108, I started blistering those things high and towering. And it just felt tremendous. And then I came back the next day and hit all 108. And they were rockets coming off there. The two and the three iron were suddenly clubs I believed in. And then another 100 the next day. And then I went and played on day four, and it was like these things had never left me. Uh, on the second shot, on the number four, I had 235 yards, it's bar five, and I hit a two iron and went just right of the green, and went high and curled back to the left and landed in the middle of the green, so I was putting for eagle, and I was like, wow, my trusted allies are back. And it was because of the work, the, the confidence that I developed on the mats. And so I'm a, a firm believer, and if you think about this, this is not much different than the Olympic diver. Uh, who, who trains with foam in the water. And what do they do? Well, you know, the platform up there for the Olympic divers is the 10 meter board, or 10 meter platform. That's 32 feet, nine inches, something like that, a little more than that. You know, and if they land on their belly, that hurts. If they do a belly buster or land on their face or whatever, you could get hurt. It doesn't, just because you're an Olympian doesn't mean they like to land on their face any more than the rest of us. And so what do they do? Well, they remove the cost of failure. How do they do that? They inject 
air bubbles into the water down there so that there's foam that's created on top of the water so that even if they land flat on their belly, it doesn't hurt. So they remove the cost of failure. And so now they can completely relax, stay single-minded about the task, learn the dive, and once they've got it, no longer uh, are living in fear, then they can have the water just be completely tranquil and uh, as usual, remove the bubbles, and they're perfectly fine. Well, that's what the mats can do for people is allow you to hit shots, lose the fear that you have, and then eventually you don't need the mats anymore. And so oftentimes when I say this to somebody, they may say in return, well, you know, Bobby, it's just not real to me. You know, I need something more realistic. But yet I will see that person when they're hitting balls on the range, take every single ball and put it up on a tuft of grass before they hit it. So for some reason, that brand of unrealistic is better than the mat brand of unrealistic. And so I guess choose your poison there. Anyway. That's what I wanted to say. I think the mats are a great thing. I think that anytime you can hit them out here, you've got a better chance of making some good solid shots and hopefully you can take that confidence to your regular grass swing. I wanna thank you for watching and I'll see you next week.